Okay, we're going to learn a mimer. The Rebbe said in a mimer from 1965 on a very powerful theme. The theme is how to deal with the financial pressures. Let's go right to it. Mimer is based on a verse in uh, Song of Songs. The great love cannot extinguish the love, nor can the rivers put it out. It means the love of the Jewish people to our God. Is that what I say? Yeah. Great water cannot extinguish the love, nor can the rivers put it out. The great waters cannot extinguish the love, nor can the rivers put it out. That means the love of the Jewish people to God is compared to a tremendous fire. And even if there's a lot of water in the rivers... Ah, yeah. And the rivers can't put it out. Emes. Says the Alter Rebbe Torah or of this week's Torah portion, which is called the Hasidic Parsha. Besides the uh, Torah portion of the week, there is the section of Torah or Kutta Torah that is connected to this week's Torah portion. It's called the Hasidic Parsha. And uh, in that, this Torah portion, this week of, of Torah or the Alter Rebbe explains. The great water refers to cold tears up The great waters refer to all of the disturbances that we have because of trying to earn a livelihood and thoughts about this world. And these thoughts strain a person and cause him to have difficulty to be devoted to serving God. And despite all this, they're unable to extinguish the love the hidden love that every single Jew has naturally to God. And just like this is true regarding our love to God, it's is also true regarding God's love to us, that His love to us remains perfect, and it's not blemished despite the fact that these great waters make it difficult for us to serve God properly. And these great waters cannot extinguish this love they can't stop this love which is hidden in our heart to be manifest and to be felt, that we should actually feel love to God. And the contrary, not only can these great waters not extinguish this love, but the opposite, they are able, these waters themselves, they actually strengthen the love and cause love to be greater because through these great waters, specifically because the love of, of, of we have to Hashem and the devotion we have to Hashem it requires us to overcome these obstacles because of these obstacles themselves. This causes us to have a higher level of service of God and that's why these great waters are called the waters of Noah. The word Noah is related to the word Nachas Ruach which means tranquility, the tranquil spirit. And the reason why these great waters, which seemingly are the opposite, they're anything but tranquil. These things cause disturbance. They cause fragmentation. They cause, they cause all confusion. The reason why they're described with this positive uh, word as waters of Noah, waters, thank you very much, of, of uh, tranquil waters, because through these waters a person reaches a higher level. Because he now, because of these waters, he needs to overcome these obstacles and to reach a higher level of love of Hashem. Like, for example, the parable that is known, which is mentioned in other places in Chassidus, of water that flows in a river. That when there is a blockage in the river that prevents the water from going further, so in the end, what happens as a result of this very blockage is that there is now an accumulation of a lot more water behind this dam or behind this block blockade. So not only does the water break through the blockade, not break through the dam, but on the contrary, through the dam itself, which was holding back the water, now the water goes with a lot greater force than when the water was flowing before this dam was built. And not only that, but more, the dam itself, those stones, that, that earth that was, that was preventing the stream of water, is now, that itself is now accompanying 
with the water too. And the, 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 that's increasing the power of the force of the water. The, the um, how, how did that guy say it? M- uh, mass times acceleration equals force. Yeah. Force is equal to mass times velocity squared. Mass times the velocity. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so, so on the contrary, not only is there is there a a a, a greater uh, force because the water was blocked up before and now it's flowing it, it broke through the dam now there's a lot more force so you could say acceleration also if you want to be in that mode instead of saying velocity right, right. Yeah. so so the <laughs> the the dam itself the dam itself is now contributing to the force of the water because the dam is going along with the water too so now there's more force in the water the, these, these things that were blocking the water are, are now flowing with the water. So it comes out, not only is the thing that was stopping the water not stopping it, on the contrary, it's increasing it. The dam elevates the entire body of water, which allows more force from the downhill flow. Which yeah, we're not talking about that. Oh. I, I, I used the wrong word, I said dam probably. I'm talking about something which is stopping the water from flowing forward. And, it, and, and so it's not like it's, it's in a dam where it goes up and goes down. It's stopping it, and the water is now accumulating, 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 until it knocks the dam down. Okay. What is that it's called? Dam. It's a dam for the purpose of holding the water back, period, rather than the one that's holding it back so you can release it. it, it it's not constructed in... The other side of the dam, we're looking at the... It, it's not constructed in a way to make the water flow in a normal way. Like, usually, you're thinking about the example, parable of Tsimsum, where there's a, where there's a, there's a contraction, and now it's possible, and more and more dams in order to... We're talking about an unhealthy Yankel who went into the, the river. He says, let me stop the Robert water somehow from flowing so quickly. Right. And, he, and, he, and he put some wood and some stones there, and he thought, oh, this will work. He put some chazerai. Yeah. He put some chazerai. Yeah. And now, not only does it not stop the water, on the contrary, the water increased. Not only the water increased, the water broke through it. Not only does the water break through it, now the water is flowing much stronger, right. but the, the, the chazerai that he put in the water is, is flowing with the water. So there's much form force, including... The, um, the, the, not just the force of the water, but also the, uh, the chazra as well. Yeah, the debris, thank you. Uh, and so, true, so too is this true regarding the, the concealment and the blockade of the great water, of the, con- of the hindrances, the obstacles, the concealment of godliness that we experience in our service of God, that this, these great waters refer to our animal soul in general, just the fact you have an animal soul, that's already an obstacle in your service of Hashem. And especially when you have disturbances of earning a livelihood, which that's an even greater and more severe obstacle. So specifically through these obstacles themselves, the Neshama reaches a higher level. What's the higher level called? It's called Bechol Miyadecha. God asks every day in Neshama, we should say the words, love Hashem with all your might. What does all your might mean? In a, in a way that's, that's beyond, beyond limitation. So what is the path that not only should this, these great waters, this, these worries about earning a livelihood, but what is the path that these great waters should not only not extinguish our love for God, but on the contrary, that they should arouse a deeper love. So the Torah says the advice for this is, is come into the ark. That means to enter, to come, to arrive, and to enter into the words of prayer. Because the, the word word and the word ark are the same. Teva means word and teva means ark. So the advice that God gives a Jew who's experiencing all these worries of, of earning a livelihood, God's advice for him is go into the ark, go into the words of prayer. Why? Because prayer, the inner meaning of prayer, is about connecting yourself with God. So that, exp- that activity, that creates love. As it says in Kunt Veda of their Brashab, that the central service of God is love. Says the Zohar, there is no service like the service of love. That means reverence for God isn't specifically um, relevant during davening because you're supposed to have reverence for God all day. There was once a, the Rebbe Hashab's sister once asked him to go horseback riding and he said, fear of, he was a little child, fear of God has to be from Meida Ani till Hamafil which I guess means no. Uh, so fear of God is supposed to be all the time. You don't need to have, um, you don't need to have uh, davening specifically 
in order to create a, a feeling of, of reverence for God. But the, the, the service of davening, what's the purpose of it is to arouse a love for Hashem. That's harder. That's harder than reverence. Reverence, as in chapter 42 in Tanya, you think for a long time how Hashem is looking at you and counting your steps. And uh, that's not necessary. It's an obligation every day to do this. But it's not only about davening, it's all day. Davening specifically about channeling a feeling of love for Hashem. So, says the Alter over there, this is the mistake of the Bali Eskim, of business people, who are very, very encumbered by things in this world. They think they're unable to pray so much like those who sit in the tents, like those who study Torah, who are not so encumbered by um, worries about this physical world. They think, say the business people, the Alter Rebbe says the business people say, they're unable to daven because they're encumbered by all these worries of this world. But the, the Torah scholars who are not encumbered by all these worries, they are able to daven. Says the Alter Rebbe, it's the opposite. They're able to daven, and not only are they able to daven, they're able to daven even more because there's more light that comes from the darkness. And that's their, what, what, this is the meaning of what the Alter writes in Tanya, in Igar Sakhoidesh, that on Shabbos and Yantiv, when those who are involved in business have time, they have an obligation to pray with a greater strength. And gra- they have a greater obligation than those who sit in tents. And it's understood, in order that they should daven properly in Shabbos and Yantif, they have to also serve Hashem during the weekday as well. Because just like physically, unless you work on Friday to prepare the food, you won't have anything to eat on, on Shabbos. So, so just like this is true for eating and drinking on Shabbos in a simple sense, so too, if you want to daven on Shabbos, it also requires preparation before Shabbos. And therefore, in order that your davening on Shabbos should be the way it's meant to be, there has to be some davening during the week as well. Because there's a relationship between the prayers of Shabbos and the meals of Shabbos. It says in Chassidus that the prayers on Shabbos have a similar energy to the bracha we say before a meal. The um, Tzemach Tzedek says that just like when a Kohen, we eat from a sacrifice, you have to make a bracha first in order to bring them the infinite light of Hashem, in order to uh, draw down through his eating the light of Hashem, so too in order to bring down the pleasure of Shabbos, through, the, through having pleasure on Shabbos to bring down the supernal pleasure, it's a daven with the right proper concentration. If you'll eat on Shabbat, that, Shabbat, Shabbat without davening, you won't accomplish anything. And the, the physical pleasure will only, only reach the external it won't reach the, the, the divine pleasure. But when you daven with, 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 with concentration, then when you eat afterwards, you will draw down supernal pleasure. Just like it was with the sacrifices, there was, the, the coin made a bracha first. So to in Shabbos, the calling out to God during davening is like saying the bracha on the mitzvah of eating on Shabbos. So regarding what our subject, just like the meals of Shabbos require preparation before Shabbos, so too does a davening on Shabbos require preparation during the week. You can't daven properly on Shabbos unless you daven during the week as well. This is understood that even during the week, those businessmen who are complaining to the Rebbe have to daven as well. But during the week, since they don't have time, so their service of God is not at length so much. And the main thing they accomplish during the week is just their concentration. They have, they're able to concentrate during the week a little bit. It says in the... In the uh, it's better to have a little bit of concentration um, and say shorter davening and say a lot of words of davening without concentration. So during the week they can't daven that much, but when they do daven, there has to be some concentration there. We could say, says the Rebbe, although the main obligation of the, these said businessmen during the week is not to daven at length, but rather to... Um, uh, but, but they should daven with concentration but they can't daven so long nevertheless um, they have to have some length of time when they daven during the week as well uh, just the altar was saying in Tanya they shouldn't be the, com- they shouldn't be the chazan the businessmen shouldn't become the chazanim during the week because then the davening of everybody have to go quicker than it needs to be so since there are others who are able to daven longer they're the, like the ones who are teaching Torah uh, those who are in Kolel and their or 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 uh, Bachrim, young people who are relying on their uh, uh, on their fathers uh, to support them, so they are the ones who be, be, should be called, be the chazan. Better they should be the chazan. They could daven longer. This is understood also that the the Alt-Rebbe 
Altarbiz says, Bizme are making a mistake, the, who think they can't have. On the contrary, Altarbiz says they could have an even better on Shabbos and Yantav. But the Altar doesn't have to say, say this about those who are not businessmen. The Altarbiz says that those who are sitting in the tents, there's obviously no room to make a mistake to think that they, they're, 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 they are unable to daven. The only ones who could think that they should make, the only ones who have the idea they should, that they can't daven are the businessmen. And therefore, the Altarbiz tells them, no, they could daven even, even better. But those who are sitting in tents, those who are set to focus on, on diligence in their Torah studies, by them, even though a person is always um, a person is always um, uh, not, not objective when it comes to themselves, nevertheless, they will not make such a mistake. So if there are businessmen, I'm sorry, if there are Torah scholars who are not diving at length, so the Alt Reb and Torah Or, um, they, they should know, the Rebbe says, that from the Alt Reb and Torah Or, there's no room for such a mistake. The Alt Rebbe says, that's not, that, that's, that, that's not the question. And this, that there are, and the fact that there are some people who think that they're diving for a while, the Rebbe says, and they're not diving at length, and no one tells them they're making any mistake. So isn't that, doesn't that mean that, 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 that the um, tzaddikim, I guess the rabbeim, are, are, are okay with it? The fact that there are people who are davening for a long time, they're not davening at length, and no one says to them anything. Doesn't that, doesn't that mean that that's okay? So the Rebbe said that it's not okay. This is already clarified by the Alter Rebbe Torah Or, that there's no room for such a mistake. That means that the, the fact that a person is not davening at length, the Rebbe says it's between him and the Alter Rebbe. He, uh, he has a responsibility to the Alter Rebbe and he shouldn't learn anything from the fact that no one's protesting. And if he has reasons for his behavior, so he should have a time, he should go and, 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 and defend himself to the Alter Rebbe. And if he has a proper answer, or if it's just an excuse, this will be discovered in his, in his conversation with the Alter Rebbe. And if he's such a person that he would rather defend himself instead of If he's, a, if he's the kind of person who's able to defend himself, the Rebbe says, better than using your, your uh, intellectual prowess to defend yourself, why don't you use all of that intellectual prowess to find a way to dive in and learn chizz better? Sorry, intellectual what? Prowess. Uh, prowess. Prowess. Oh, sorry, the chelum. That, that means he's, he, he's, he's a smart aleck. He's able to, to defend himself to the Alter Rebbe, and he has all these reasons why he's not able to dive in. The Rebbe says, okay, so you, you're, you're, you're gifted. Use those gifts to, da- to learn chizz better. So and and practically daven longer with and not just not just with concentration but daven with a longer amount of time, and those who think that they're able to accomplish this in a little bit of time, and they say that it's it's a good does, didn't I just quote before the Rebbe quoted us before it's better to daven less time with concentration than a long time without concentration. So the Rebbe says not true, rather when you daven with less time you have less concentration in order to properly reach a, the right level of concentration it requires the meditation requires a long time the proof from this is is from the Alter Rebbe that the Alter Rebbe says in Tanya that you should spend time diving during the week an hour and a half at least and if you're able to accomplish this with a little bit of time the Alter Rebbe wouldn't say this especially with such a strength such a force Specifically, the length of time. If it was possible, the last time we wouldn't say this. And more, I heard they ever told someone in, in an audience that nowadays it's sufficient at least an hour. I don't know. Um, okay. And furthermore, maybe Monday Thursday is longer. Um, oh, the Rebbe said during the Swimer, some uh, one people used to say that it's better to sleep for a half hour under your talus so that people should think they're meditating on something. And then they'll be also want to want to, want to dive in as well. So even though if you're not, even if you're not diving where you're meant to be, but it's, it's better that... <laughs> you volunteer for that job. <laughs> <laughs> and furthermore, regarding those in intense, regarding those who are, who are not encumbered by earning a living, if they don't dive in at length, that will affect others that they'll learn from them. And they'll, they'll make a kalva chomer. They'll say it's logical. 
If those, the businessmen will make, a, will, make the, will deduce and say the following. If those in sit in tents who have time, they dive in a very short amount of time. So when someone does not have time, for sure my dive could be even shorter. Okay. Now the Rebbe focuses a little bit more on the language of the Alter Rebbe in Torah or. The Alter Rebbe uses the words businessmen in the plural and those who sit in tents in the plural. He doesn't say a businessman or a Torah scholar. He uses it in the plural. Why, is he, why does he do this? Even though the Maimarim, the discourses in Torah or, are not what the Alter wrote himself, however, since the Semach Tzedek chose these um, manuscripts and he printed them in or Torah or the Torah, they're certainly precise. And especially because the, the uh, it says just like in, in the Geras Hakodesh, um, it's the um, Alter Rebbe. It says over there, um, the Alter Rebbe did himself look at them and edit them, and therefore you can pay attention to, to the specific words that are used there. So we need to understand why does it say those who sit in tents in the plural? The fact that it says businessmen in the plural, that we understand because there are people who are involved in the Rishus HaRabim. The Rishus HaRabim literally means a public domain. But it also means, um, it's called in, in Kabbalah, Tour de Pura, separate mountains. Being involved in a place where, where the, in the mundane, is being involved in a place where it feels like there are many masters. So the businessmen who are involved in, in, in the outside, in the, in the mountains of separation, in the, in the klippa, they're involved in things which obscure and high godliness, so it makes sense that we, call, we refer to them in the plural. But regarding those who sit in tents, regarding those who sit in the tents of Torah, the Torah is a one Torah. Torah is about unity. Why do we use the expression tents in the plural? Well, there stands for first explaining what the Torah says about Yaakov. It says about Yaakov, Yaakov was a sincere person who sat in the tents. And the Talmud explains who were the tents that he sat in. He sat in the tents of shame, the tents of Aver. Those were the those were the yeshivas that Yaakov studied in. So the what the what the Alter Reb is what what that language over there in the Torah about shame and aver that refers to the written Torah and the oral Torah. Shame and aver respectively refer to the written Torah and the oral or the oral Torah. As the Machzedek says that the word shame means name, and because all the whole entire Torah, the written Torah, is all names of God. Every word in the written Torah is the name of God. Therefore. Title of the written Torah is the tenth of shame, the tenth of God's name. However, the word aver, aver refers to the oral Torah, because uh, aver means to pass. So the um, the function of the oral Torah is to draw down and reveal the written Torah. It's to pass it through. So. The author of it says about the mistake of the businessmen, that they think they're not able to dive in so much, like those who sit in tents. The author of it is talking about um, those who sit in tents in the same language that he uses about the um, businessmen. Because in both of them, both the scenarios, there is the same intent. Meaning, just like regarding the businessmen, the intent is that. We're not only referring to someone who has many businesses, but also someone who was, has one business. The altar encourages them to dive in at length as well. So too regarding those who sit in tents, which we said before that there's no room for a mistake to think they cannot dive in. The intent of the altar is to say that those who, not only who those who sit in, in both tents, not only those who learn the written Torah and the oral Torah, but even someone who learns only one of those kinds of Torah, and that means his study of Torah is only in one way, he only learns the oral Torah, or he only learns the written Torah. Also, for him, the author is saying there's no room for such a mistake. What's the difference between the written Torah and the oral Torah? Regarding the written Torah, the focus is on the words. That's why even an ignoramus can say a blessing on the written Torah, because the focus is not understanding, the focus is just saying the words. But... The oral Torah, the main thing of the oral Torah is about understanding it. So only when you, when you understand and use your own words to explain it, that means you got it. 
So that means in the written Torah, the focus is on the words. In the oral Torah, the focus is on, on, on your understanding. Um, so there are those who make a mistake and think that in order to be able to um, daven at length, they have to be doing a lot of chassidus. You have to understand it really well. But if, if he doesn't learn chassidus that deeply and doesn't learn that much, he thinks he can daven. So the altar says, you're making a mistake. Even if you're learning chassidus as if it's the written Torah, you don't understand it. You're just saying the words of chassidus. Uh, it's obvious. There's no room to make a mistake. That you're able to daven. Just like those who learn chassidus in, this, in, in a manner of the oral Torah, deeply and back and forth, um, and also someone who learns this very deeply may think, I don't need a daven. So the Altipus says there's no room for such a mistake. Whatever tent you're sitting in, whether you're sitting in the tent of the written Torah, you're just saying the words of Chassidus, you don't understand what you're saying, or you're sitting in the tent of the oral Torah, going really deep into it, you're, it's obvious that you're, you're able, you need to daven. And this is the meaning of the verse. The great waters can extinguish the, the love that through being involved in davening, both by those who sit in the tents and by the businessmen, not only will the great waters, the, all these disturbances, these physical, the, the encumberment of all kinds of uh, financial responsibilities, not only will this not extinguish the love, which, all, which not only businessmen have these responsibilities and, and worries, but also those who sit in the tents also do. But not only will the great waters not extinguish it, but on the contrary, there'll be a higher level in the service of Hashem. The water will make, make them reach a higher level. And that's the meaning of the end of the verse. That the, as the verse continues, The, um, okay, it's time ready to stop. Well, let's try to finish this quickly. Um, the um, the Alt Rebbe over there in, in Torah Or discusses the continuation of the verse and explains how we're talking about the level of loving Hashem with all your might. Um, and when a person reaches a level of loving Hashem with all of his might, so if a person will give all of his wealth away because of his love, it won't bother him. It will be like, ah, big deal. It's nothing to give away all my, all my house, all my... All my be happy about it. Basically, it was like it's nothing. Wow. So in a similar way, the Alter says that the Hoin Beisei, the wealth of the home, refers to Gan Eden. Because of the great waters that Jew, Jew experiences, they yearn to the essence of Hashem. And all the pleasures of Gan Eden are considered insignificant because of his great yearning to Hashem himself. And this brings him to have a younger sister. They have a younger sister. The word sister is associated with oneness. Achis comes from the word oneness, which is an even higher level, that means that after a person achieves the love of Hashem with all of his might, which that itself has many levels, in addition to this, um, he reaches the level of the sister, which is the idea of oneness, until we reach the day, the day that we'll, we will speak about our sister, which was referring to the, um, when a person, the shimim shidubarba means one sentence, that you're davening from by yourself, so to speak, without without any it's like it's coming. It's as if it's like flowing naturally. Um, so it's like, like it says in the Torah, my tongue should respond to your word. So through reaching the level of loving Hashem with all your might, reach a high level of level of the oneness of Hashem with like a sister. Until biyim shidu berba, that the davening will just flow uh, by itself. Uh, When you talk to a, a different woman, it should be more unguarded and easy. And, you know. it, it's referring to uh, specific, saying words of Torah. You're saying words of Torah, you feel like Hashem is speaking to you. That's, that's emphasis. Well, I'm not from what I said earlier. I think if you ask the Rebbe whether you should put out this one or this one, I think you know what the answer is. This one, I think you know what the answer is. This one, I think you know what the answer is. This one, I think you know what the answer is.